immortalized as the most exclusive club, and it's by invitation only. You can't buy a membership, you can't use political influence, you can't cheat your way into it. Everybody wants in. Presidents, kings, celebrities, political leaders create effigies and build monuments just to be immortalized. Dictators create a culture that's nothing short of idol worship. Children sing their praises every single day. All of this in an effort to be remembered. Think of what Muawiyah did. He tried every trick in the book, yet nothing remains of him in his own capital city. The only significant ancient structure that remains erect in Damascus is the shrine of Hussein's three-year-old orphan. What this means is to become immortal, one has to pass crucial divine tests. To learn more on how we can gain access to the ultimate privilege, we explore the lives of a number of companions, ordinary people who became extraordinary. Looking for clues as to what turned them into the invincible forces of nature that shaped history despite being persecuted and in many cases murdered. Individuals who carved their names in the annals of history as giants of devotion, faith, and sacrifice. Many are obscure to the average viewer, but that will be no more. These are their stories. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وحبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الغرر الميامين سيما بقية الله في الأرضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وصاحب نعمتنا وولي أمرنا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة بن الحسن العسكري فداه أرواح العالمين My dear brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Tonight, we are talking about a giant in the history of Islam an individual who shattered all the molds and stereotypes, a man who proved to humanity once and for all that you are not captivated by your past, by your history, by your genealogy, by the family you are born into. You can carve your own destiny. You can choose who you want to be. This man is Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. His mother was Asma bint Umais, this valiant, loyal, early Muslim who embraced this religion, not just in word, but also in deed until her last days. But his father, requires no introduction. It is, of course, Abu Bakr ibn Abi Quhafa, the Prophet's companion and the first of the three Sunni Khulafa. What we can say and surmise from the history of Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, there is, of course, a great deal to discuss because he became an incredibly controversial figure, a personality that the Sunni school struggles to come to terms with and struggles to define. But let's talk about his life and legacy and try and extrapolate incredibly valuable lessons from them. Muhammad was born when his parents were on their way to perform Hajj alongside the Holy Prophet in what is known as Hajjatul Wida'. And so on their way 
to Mecca. He was born and was presented to the, to the Holy Prophet. May God's peace and blessings be upon him. Who upon meeting Muhammad for the first time, his, no, his own namesake, the Holy Prophet performed what we call tahnik, hannakahu Rasulullah, which is a recommended practice that when a child is born, you take a piece of date, you try to pre-digest it, and you stick it to the top of the mouth, to the rooftop of the mouth, of this newborn child. The Holy Prophet did that using his own saliva. So the blessed saliva of the Holy Prophet of Islam was the first thing that this infant child, Muhammad, had to eat from this world. And of course, that left a massive impact on him. One thing that's worth noting is that now when Wahhabis speak of Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, they try to undermine his status and they try to diminish the position that he holds uh, in early Islam and the formative period of our religion by noting that he cannot be labeled as a companion. He's not a Sahabi, they say. Because a Sahabi is supposed to be someone who met the Prophet, who heard the Prophet. And obviously they have multiple definitions of the word Sahabi and there's a lot of confusion even within their own schools about that. But when it comes to Wahhabis, they'll conveniently dismiss Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr as a non-Sahabi. And in doing so, they try to take from him the immunity that comes with being a companion. And so they say that he's not a Sahabi. But our question to them is that which of the Sahaba received the honor of the Holy Messenger of God himself putting that first bite into their mouths using his own blessed holy saliva no less. But of course try they will and fail they most certainly do. Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr was a giant and a great example, example because by doing the things that he did, he destroyed a number of common misconceptions and stereotypes. For example, the idea that you adopt your father's characteristics. There's a saying in the, it's a common expression in the English language where they say, like father, like son. The idea being that if a father is good, then the son will almost always turn out good. But if the father is bad, the son will follow in his father's footsteps as well. But of course we know that Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, along with other people, they defied the stereotype. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يُخْرِجُ الْحَيَّ مِنَ الْمَيِّتِ وَالْمَيِّتَ مِنَ الْحَيِّ يُخْرِجُ الْخَبِيثَ مِنَ الطَّيِّبِ وَالطَّيِّبَ مِنَ الْخَبِيثِ God sometimes allows the best of people to be born into the worst of families. Or the worst people to be conceived by the best of people. For example, the son of Prophet Nuh ala nabiyyina wa alihi wa alihi salam who was evil despite having a father who was a prophet of God and an apostle and a messenger. And of course the reverse is always true as well. Where you could have people who are evil but whose children turn out to be the purest and the best. There are other examples as I said. For instance, Many of you might have heard the name Khalid ibn al-Walid, this vile enemy of the Ahlul Bayt, this person who is glorified nowadays, ironically, despite being behind some of the worst attacks against the Holy Messenger of God and the early Muslims. We all know about the Battle of Uhud, for instance, 
And the fact that a group of Muslims that were stationed atop a mountain or a hill refused to listen to the Prophet's instructions and ended up creating a um, vacuum. And that led to the Muslim army being defeated and the Prophet's beloved uncle Hamza being killed and so many other Muslims being martyred. And yet most people fail to neglect, fail to uh, know th that is that the person responsible for the ambush against the Muslim army was Khalid ibn al-Walid. Khalid ibn al-Walid's uh, stance against the Prophet and against the Messenger's family and against the household of Rasulullah is quite famous. But did you know that he had two sons? One of them is named Abdul Rahman. And Abdul Rahman followed in his father's footsteps. Like father, like son. Abdul Rahman became uh, the person appointed by the third Khalifa to be the governor of Homs in Syria and ended up switching loyalties to Muawiyah. Muawiyah eventually had him murdered because he feared that Abdul Rahman ibn Khalid might be a competition uh, for his son Yazid becoming the successor. So he had him murdered as he did with many others. So Abdul Rahman was just like his father Khalid. But did you know that Khalid also had another son named Al-Muhajir ibn Khalid ibn al-Walid? <clears throat> And this man was a companion of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib. So much so that he participated with the Imam in the battles of Jamal, as well as the battle of Safin, and was eventually martyred in the battle of Safin. In other words, these two brothers came face to face. Muhajir fighting for the commander of the faithful, and Abdul Rahman, fighting for Muawiyah. They came face to face, they fought against one another, and Muhajir was martyred. But again, he broke the stereotype, and he shattered this mold that is embedded in many people's heads that you can't change who you are. But no, of course you can. Um, these two, incidentally, Khalid ibn al-Walid had a father named al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. And this man was called من أشد عتات قريش والمشركين. He was considered to be one of the staunchest enemies of Rasulullah. Never ended up becoming a Muslim. Fought against the Prophet with every iota of his existence. Because he was jealous of the Prophet. He was envious of the fact that prophethood would be sent to Bani Hashim as opposed to Bani Makhzum because uh, Al Walid ibn Mughira was from Bani Makhzum and he was extremely wealthy, very, very rich, and he wanted for himself to be the Prophet. So his envy and his jealousy led him to incredible hatred and tremendous um, scorn against the Holy Prophet. And of course, that scorn was passed down to Khalid and from Khalid to Abdul Rahman. But look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saves Muhajir ibn Khalid from this family that is made up of the enemies of God and his messenger. Um, another example of people who defied the stereotype and broke the mold is a man by the name of Hashim ibn Utbah. And Hashim ibn Utbah, in many of our books, as well as many historical accounts, is also known as Hashim al-Mirqal. He was the son of Utbah, Utbah ibn Abi Waqqas, who was the brother of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, which makes Hashim al-Mirqal the first cousin of Umar ibn Sa'd, subhanallah. And yet, Hashim al-Mirqal, was one of the companions of Amir al muminin and uh, someone who was also martyred in the battle of Safin. And there are many, many other people who again defy this idea that 
you are who you are and you can't change who you are and that your father and your ancestors, they're the ones who ultimately shape your personality, that is absolutely not the case. So let's go back to Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. He was among the best companions of Amir al-Mu'mineen. In fact, as we've said before, he was among the disciples of Ali ibn Abi Talib, according to the tradition of Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam, who said that a caller will come on the day of judgment and will call out for the disciples of Ali. A few will rise, among whom is Amr ibn al-Hamiq al-Khuza'i and Uwais al-Qarani, and of course, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, which makes you think. His father being who he was, the enemy of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the number one enemy. And yet this person whose father is this turns out to be among the disciples of that. How does this happen? Of course, it happens when you are equipped with the kind of resolve that Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr did. It happens because of many factors because of his mother, and we'll get to that later on, because of the environment that he was surrounded with, the fact that Ali ibn Abi Talib was the one who raised him, he was fed the love of Ali and the family of Ali from day one. Because Asma bint Umais, after being married to Abu Bakr and having Muhammad, she later married Amir al Mu'mineen. Within a few years, about three years or so, when Abu Bakr died, Asma bint Umais returned to the household of Bani Hashim because she was married to Ja'far ibn Abi Talib prior to Abu Bakr and now she was married to Amir al-Mu'mineen. There are some highlights from the life of Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr that I'd like to draw your attention to in this short uh, program, inshallah. The first is the battle of the camel. This uh, painfully uh, dark episode in the history of Islam. It was so dark in fact that it continues to stain the face of the proponents of the Khilafah system. It is an indefensible crime that was committed against not only the Muslim Ummah, not only the 30,000 people who perished because of that fitna, but against the Prophet's own appointed successor, against the Imam of the time, against Ali ibn Abi Talib, whom the Prophet declared, Ya Ali, harbuka harbi wa silmuka silmi. Oh Ali, whoever fights you, fights me. Whoever is at peace with you, is at peace with me. The Prophet said this, and th these are Sunni sources that narrate this hadith. The Prophet said this about Imam Ali, he said it about Fatima, he said it about Hassan, he said it about Hussein. And yet, you had these vile enemies of God wage war against the commander of the faithful and therefore against the Prophet himself. Many people died, many people perished. Aisha, who was the tip of the spear of the Battle of the Jamal, which is why the battle is named after the camel on which Aisha was riding. There's a reason why it's given that name. If somebody tries to tell you, oh, Aisha had nothing to do with it, Aisha was only there to try and reconcile, why is it named Waqatul Jamal? The battle of the camel, because she was sitting on that camel, directing her army and giving them inspiration, manipulating them, telling them what to do, calling on to them to kill Ali ibn Abi Talib. She is famously declared as having said on uh, the battle of the camel, kill Ali for he is a kafir. Unbelievable audacity. Aisha entered the city of Basra. She went there with only about five or 600 people with her. But when she went, historians say that within one month, Aisha was able to put together an army of a hundred thousand, which tells you all you need to know about the power of manipulation that she had. She was incredibly um, influential. In fact, one could call her the first Instagram influencer. 
in that sense. And of course, she did so by using her status, her uh, relations uh, to the Prophet. The fact that she was the wife of the Prophet was extremely highlighted throughout that saga. One of the people, and this is a bit of a sidetrack, but it's important to mention because it gives you an idea of how manipulative the whole thing was. An individual by the name of Ka'b ibn Sur was the leader of the Azd tribe. Now the tribe of Azd was incredibly powerful. It had many members and there were warriors. And so trying to sway this person, the, the chief of the tribe, Ka'b ibn Sur, over to Aisha's side became a strategic decision. So she sent him a message asking him to join her, but he refused. He, like anyone who has any trace of intelligence, knows that you don't face off with Ali and get away with it. Ali, after all, was the one who defended Rasulullah in his every battle and every war. And even we mentioned the battle of Uhud, for example, when everybody abandoned Rasulullah and everybody fled, only about 10 people remained. And Rasulullah was heard saying, Aina kashiful karbi an wajhi. Where is the one who's going to repel danger from me? And when they said, Who are you talking about? He said, Ali, Aina Habibi Ali. So Ali ibn Abi Talib was quick to return to the Prophet from the battlefield and to defend him and to protect him. So Anyone who has any level of intelligence, even a child's level of intelligence, knows that you don't go to fight Ali ibn Abi Talib. So this man, Ka'b ibn Sur, refused to go at first. Aisha realized that she couldn't wage this war without uh, Ka'b ibn Sur and the tribe of Azd. So now that her message to him was ineffective, she decided to do it on her own. So she went to meet him in person. She started to cry and to weep. And she said, Oh Ka'b, don't you wish to defend your mother? Am I not your mother? Am I not the mother of the believers? She spoke to him in those words, appealing to his emotional side. And eventually he agreed. She manipulated him to the extent that he took up a copy of the Quran. He hung the copy of the Quran around his neck and he swore that he will defend his mother to the death, meaning defend Aisha. So having secured the allegiance of the tribe of Azd and Ka'b ibn Sur, Aisha was now happy. Incidentally, historians say that when the battle of the camel ended, Amir al-Mu'mineen went after the leaders of the fitna in the army of Aisha. So he went and he asked for each of them to be sat upright. They were dead after all. They were uh, lying there on the, on the ground. But the Imam said, Ajlisu, have, have them sit up so I can address them and speak to them. Allahu Akbar. So the Imam uh, went through these individuals one by one, including Talha, including others. When he got to Ka'b ibn Sur, the leader of the Azd tribe, the Imam looked at him, he said, This is the one that came out to fight us with a copy of the Quran hanging around his neck. Claiming that he's here to defend his mother. Calling the people to what is in this Quran. Even though he knows nothing about what is in the Quran. They have have him sit upright so the Imam could address him. فأجلس, when he sat upright, قَالَ لَهُ أَمِيرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَا كعب. He addressed him by his name. لَقَدْ وَجَدْتُ مَا وَعَدَنِي رَبِّي حَقَّا I have found what God promised me to be the truth. فَهَلْ وَجَدْتَ مَا وَعَدَكَ رَبُّكَ حَقَّا Did you find what God promised to be the truth? ثُمَّ قَالَ أَضْجِعُوا كَعْبًا These are the same words that Rasulullah God's Messenger used when speaking to his enemies after the Battle of Badr. Subhanallah. Amir al muminin is the brother of Rasulullah. He's now using the same words against these hypocrites and these liars and these dead cadavers that came out 
and caused so much fitna and so much havoc in the battle of Jamal. The Imam then came across the body of Talha ibn Ubaidillah and he addressed him and said, This is the one that broke his vow that he gave to me, but he broke that promise, he broke that pledge. He's the one that started this discord and this fitna in the nation. And he's the one who called on to others to come and fight me. He called for me to be killed and for my family and children to be murdered. The Imam said, have him sit upright. فأجلس فقال أمير المؤمنين يا طلحة قد وجدت ما وعدني ربي حقا فهل وجدت ما وعد ربك حقا He repeated the same statement meaning that I will receive what God promised me and that is paradise and you have you found hell now that God now that you are dead just as God promised you ثم قال أضجعوا طلحة وسار Have him lie down again and he left This is why I mentioned uh, Kaab uh, the chief of the tribe of Bani Azd, because this tribe played a crucial role in the battle of Jamal, to the point that they were the ones defending the camel. And historians say that when the, the battle was at its most intense time, a call was made, Ya ma'ashar al-azdi alaykum ummukum fa innaha salatukum wa sawmukum. O people of Azd, be careful, protect your mother because she is your prayer, she, she is your fast, she is your religion. In other words, if you must die in defense of this camel and the one riding it, then so be it, you have to do so. Now, who fought against Aisha in the battle of the camel? It was her own brother, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. He was in fact the first person to go to the Hawdaj, uh, the uh, seat that was used primarily by women and uh, children on the camel, he was the first person to go towards it. Historians say, He entered, he put his hand inside the hawdaj. So Aisha said, Man ant, Who are you? He said, Ana abghadu ahliki ilayk. I am the one family member that you hate the most, Muhammad. I am your brother Muhammad. Aisha responded by twisting his name. She said, Mudhammam. Now, Muhammad means the one who is praiseworthy, the one who is praised by everyone. Mudhammam comes from the word Vameem, which is the antonym of Muhammad. In other words, Aisha is using this slur against her brother. Instead of calling him Muhammad, she says, You are Mudhammam. You are the one who is cursed, not the one who's praiseworthy. Now why I say this is because I find it truly ironic and interesting that in Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet is quoted by Abu Huraira as having said that when the Quraysh want to curse me, when they want to use a profanity against me, they also call me Mudhammam. So I find it interesting that the idolaters of Quraysh would use the same term to insult Rasulullah as Aisha used to insult her brother Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. But of course Aisha is now defeated. The camel has been killed, the army has been destroyed, Ali ibn Abi Talib has claimed victory. So she doesn't want to overstep, she doesn't want to cross any red lines. So she then says to her brother, Alhamdulillah alladhi sallamak. Thank God for having kept you safe. I'm so glad you weren't killed. So Muhammad said, Qad kana dhalika ma takrahin. You didn't want me to be safe. You didn't want me to survive this war. Qalat Aisha, ya akhi, law karihtuhu ma qultuh. But if I didn't want to uh, see you safe and sound, I wouldn't have said this. So Muhammad said, Kunti tuhabbina al-dhafar wa anni qutilt. Didn't you, didn't you want to win this war so that I would also be killed? I would have been killed. There was no other way you could have uh, won this war and defeated Ali ibn Abi Talib. So Aisha said, Qad kuntu ahabbu dhalik. Yes, I would have loved to have won this war. And yes, if you had been killed alongside uh, uh, you know, my victory, then so be it. Uh, 
لَمَّا صِرْنَا إِلَى مَا صِرْنَا إِلَيْهِ But now that we are where we are, أَحْبَبْتُ سَلَامَتَكْ لِقَرَابَتِي مِنْكِ I'm still glad that you made it because of our relationship with each other. Remember, she was extremely afraid. One of the things, let me just go back a few steps. One of the things that historians say about the Battle of the Camel is that the tribe of uh, Bani Azd, they defended the camel with such ferocity that some historians say 15,000 hands were severed and amputated because they were competing to hold the reins to the camel. In other words, you had these people who were literally dying for Aisha. They were all killed, all these hands were cut off and amputated. The battle had ended and so now Aisha is afraid of what Ali might do to her. She's afraid of the vengeance of Ali. She's afraid that she'll be held to account for all these dead people and uh, uh, the mayhem and the pandemonium that was caused. So she now says to her brother, أَحْبَبْتُ سَلَامَتَكْ لِقَرَابَتِي مِنْكِ I'm happy that you're safe because we're related, remember? فَكْفُفْ وَلَا تُعَقِّبِ الْأُمُورِ So please don't do anything. Aisha is saying to her brother Muhammad, وَخُذِ الظَّاهِرْ وَلَا تَكُنْ لَوْمَهِ وَلَا عُذْلَهِ don't blame me. Don't admonish me. Just leave me alone. This is what our father would have wanted. Subhanallah, at this moment, Amir al Mu'mineen came to the Hawdaj and he addressed Aisha by saying, Ya Humayra, bihada awsaki Rasulullah. Is this what the Prophet would have wanted you to do? To attack me, to wage war against me? to have 30,000 Muslims killed as a result of your little adventure. فَقَالَتْ يَبْنَ أَبِي طَالِبْ مَلَكْتَ فَصْفَحْ وَظَفَرْتَ فَسْجَحْ O son of Abi Talib, now that you are the victor, forgive me. Ali ibn Abi Talib said, what else can I do but to forgive and forget? I am not going to kill you. And so the Imam then said to Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, he said to him, شَأْنُكَ بِأُخْتِكْ فَلَا يَدْنُوَ مِنْهَا أَحَدٌ سواك. Look after the affairs of your sister. Don't let anyone get near her except you. Subhanallah, ya Amir al mumineen Look at his ghira. Look at his mercy. Look at his compassion. His enemy who caused the deaths of so many. And yet Ali ibn Abi Talib says, don't let anyone get near her except you because you are her brother. ثُمَّ أَرْسَلَهَا إِلَى البصرة. The Imam then Asked, he brought 40 women, dressed them up like soldiers, like men, and had them all wear masks and covered their faces so no one would know that these are in fact women. 40 of them, and he sent them along with uh, the caravan of Aisha back to Basra. Now, if you want more information, by the way, about the Battle of the Camel, I would advise you to go back, and all of these are mentioned in Tarikh al Tabari, these are all Sunni sources. Uh, the book of Al Isti'ab, uh, Ibn Abdul Birr al Andalusi, uh, called Al Isti'ab fi Ma'rifat al Ashab, also an incredible resource, also by a Sunni scholar. You can refer to those. Um, and to learn more about this uh, decisive and consequential battle, which opened the floodgates of battles and wars and bloodshed and fitna against the household of Rasulullah. So, this was Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. There are a few hadiths about him, about him that I'd like to share with you. The first is um, a group of companions were with Imam As-Sadiq alayhi salam. Uh, one of them says that we brought up Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr in his presence and we wanted the reaction of the Imam. So the Imam responded by saying, Rahimahullah wa salla alayhi. May God have mercy on him and bless him. Now the Imam is telling us a story. He says, one day, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr came to the commander of the faithful. He said to him, أبسط يدك أبايعك أو أبسط يدك أبايعك Lay down your hand so I can give you my pledge of allegiance. فقال, the Imam said to him, but you already have done so. قال, بلى, yes, I have. I wish to do it again. قال أشهد أنك إمام مفترض الطاعة I bear witness that you are an imam, a leader whose obedience is obligated by God himself وأن أبي في النار 
and that my father is in hell. These are the words of Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. Don't kill the messenger. He is the son of Abu Bakr, but he is the partisan and disciple of Ali. Another hadith says that when he was killed, the Imam jaza'a ala Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr jaza'an shadidan. Amir al muminin cried excessively for Muhammad. So some came up to the Imam and they said to him, Ya Amir al muminin he was after all the son of Abu Bakr. So what makes you so emotional? What makes you so upset? Why would you grieve his death? The Imam explained, Ma yamna'uni annahu kana li rabiban. He was my son. And he was a brother to my children. And I was a father to him and I counted him as among my sons. Allahu Akbar. Imagine Amir al-Mu'mineen is saying he was a son to me. I was a father to him. And he is a brother to Hassan and Hussein and Abbas. What does that make Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr? It makes him one of the Ahlul Bayt. Muhammad ibn min sulbi Abi Bakr, as the Imam is famously quoted to have said. He is my son, even though he is the seed of Abu Bakr. He also said, فَلَقَدْ كَانَ إِلَيَّ حَبِيبًا He was beloved to me. وَكَانَ لِي رَبِيبًا And he was brought up by me. When they brought news of his death, and I'll talk a little bit about how he was killed, but when they brought news to the Imam, the Imam said, فَعِنْدَ اللَّهِ نَحْتَسِبُهُ We ask God to look after him. وَلَدًا نَاصِحًا وَعَامِلًا كَادِحًا وَسَيْفًا قَاطِعًا وَرُكْنًا رَافِعًا The Imam describes Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr like this, a good son, a hard worker, a servant who was obedient and a sword that cut off any uh, tree of fitna and mischief. When they told the Imam about him, uh, at tabari mentions an incident where someone came and told the Imam exactly how they killed Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. And they told him, I've never seen the city of Damascus in such jubilation and festivity the way I've seen them celebrating the murder of Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. Subhanallah. If you're related to Abu Bakr, you automatically get special privileges. Aisha has special privileges because she's the daughter of Abu Bakr. <coughs> if you're related to Umar, you get special privileges like Abdullah ibn Umar. If you have any relation to them, you are respected and honored unless you are Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. The one son of Abu Bakr who has no privileges in their religion, who has no respect in their ideology is Muhammad because he was a Shia of Ali. And now Damascus is celebrating the murder of Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. So when they told Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Imam said, إِنَّ حُزْنَنَا عَلَيْهِ عَلَىٰ قَدْرِ سُرُورِهِمْ بِهِ our sadness for his loss is as much as their jubilation for his death. They now have one less enemy. And we have one less sweetheart, one less friend. You, O Muhammad, are the best of your household. Now, I want to mention this hadith of Imam Sadiq salam, although we don't have much time to talk about it. In this narration, the Imam says, كانت النجابة في محمد بن أبي بكر قد أتته من قبل أمه أسماء بنت عميس لا من قبل أبيه What you see in Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr in terms of his nobility, in terms of his loyalty, in terms of his faith, in terms of his devotion, in terms of his belief, in terms of his commitment, to God and his prophet and his successors comes from his mother Asma bint Umais. Not from his father, but from his mother. Which tells you what, and I say this to all the young men who are looking to get married, look for a woman who's going to give children to people who are lovers of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Don't choose a wife 
because she happens to be beautiful in her pictures that she posts on social media sites. Don't choose someone because she comes from an important family or a rich fa parent, a father or what have you. Choose someone who's going to give you children that will die for the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib, just like Asma who gave birth to, Asma, to Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. Now, I won't have much time to discuss this, but eventually Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr was appointed by the commander of the faithful to be his governor in Egypt. When he was sent, the Imam wrote a long letter to the people of Egypt and instructing them to obey Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, telling them that if you obey him, you will receive nothing but guidance. Allahu Akbar. Now, who killed him? It was a man by the name of Muawiyah ibn Hudayj. Muawiyah ibn Hudayj and Amr ibn al-As. Allah. This commander of Muawiyah's army, this advisor to the vile creature that was Muawiyah, Amr ibn al-As, who always desired the governorship and the uh, kingdom of Egypt to come under his control because he's famous for saying that the women of Egypt are beautiful, subhanAllah. His desire was to get access to um, Egyptian women. And so Muawiyah now told him that if you want Egypt, you, go, you have to go and kill Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, who was the governor of Amir al-Mu'mineen. So he goes to Egypt. They ambushed the small army of Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. The general in charge of the army was a man by the name of Kanana ibn Bishr, who is also accused of killing Uthman. Uh, he was a great warrior, a brave man, and a Shia of Imam Ali, who was the top lieutenant in the army of Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. And in, in fact, I was going through Tariq al-Tabari, who said that anyone who attacked Kanana ibn Bishr, this man single-handedly would push away an entire army of men. But eventually, they outnumbered him because Amr ibn al-As sent a message back to Muawiyah asking him to send reinforcements from Sham. And they came and they were dozens of times bigger than the army of Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. They killed Kanana ibn Bishr and they eventually led the small number of people that were surrounding Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr to flee from him as they fled from Rasulullah in the battle of Uhud. Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr was left all alone. They got to him. When they captured him, uh, At-Tabari said, he said to uh, Amr ibn al-As and uh, Muawiyah ibn Hudayj, he said to him, Asquni min al -ma, give me a drink of water. So Muawiyah ibn Hudayj said to him, La saqahu Allah in saqaka qatratan abada. We won't give you a drop of water. Subhanallah. This Umayyad tradition of starving people to death, of not allowing people to quench their thirst, was established long before Karbala. It was only implemented in Karbala because it was what they wanted, what their forefathers wanted, what Muawiyah wanted, what his predecessors wanted. They said, Muawiyah ibn Hudayj said, no, we're not going to give you a drink of water. And then he said to him, you know what I'm going to do to you? أَتَعْلَمُ مَا أَنَا صَانِعٌ بِكَ Allahu you want to kill someone. First of all, Amir al Mu'mineen, the Holy Prophet, all these righteous men are famous for saying that if you capture someone as a prisoner in war, you don't kill them. If someone flees, you don't kill them. You don't run after them. But these people don't know any values or principles. These are, after all, the people who were handpicked by Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. So, what else do you expect? So, Muawiyah said to uh, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, he said to him, do you, do you know what I'm going to do to you? He said, what? He said, I will put you in the carcass of a donkey and I will set the carcass alight. I will burn you alive inside this carcass. Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr said to him, if you do this to me, this has been done to people before me. The people of Namrud did this to Ibrahim alayhi salam. So I'm not surprised that you want to do this to me. May Allah make the fire as he made it to Ibrahim. And may Allah burn you and burn Amr ibn al-As and burn Muawiyah in the fires of hell. So they, they took Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. 
they put him inside the carcass of the donkey and then they set the donkey alight. Allahu Akbar. They burned him alive and they had him killed just like that. Now, in the end, I want to take you back to the battle of the camel. We all know that in order for the battle to end, the camel had to be killed. Amir al muminin called out, اُقْتُلُ jamal, Kill this camel. As long as this camel is standing up, فَإِنَّهُ shaytan. This camel is the devil. If, as long as this camel stays standing up, the war will continue. In order to end this war, the camel has to go down. Who killed the camel? It was none other than Imam al-Hasan al-Mushtaba alayhi salam When he went, Aisha was looking. She said, when I saw Hassan approaching, I saw the two eyes of Rasulullah in his eyes. Of course, he was the grandson of the Prophet. Imam al-Hasan came, he slit the camel's throat, killed it, and ended the battle once and for all. This was very hard for Aisha. Do you know when and how she responded to Imam al-Hasan? When Imam al-Hasan's body was being carried from his home to his final resting place. Aisha responded to Imam al-Hasan killing the camel by ordering her men to shoot his body with so many arrows that historians say that when they laid the Imam's body next to his grave, they had to pluck out 70 arrows from his blessed body. Allahu Akbar. What a tragedy this was. The son of Rasulullah, Al Hassan al Zaki al Mushtaba, the one Rasulullah would carry on his shoulder, the one Rasulullah would kiss. The one the Prophet used to say, Al Hassan wal Hussein Imaman, Al Hassan wal Hussein Sayyida Shababi Ahl al Jannah, is now being attacked by the arrows. 70 arrows would have to be pulled out. أحب الله من أحب حسينا أحب الله من أحب حسينا أجب شوري تومو جبهات حلا بيكم روي لبهات أحب الله من أحب حسينا Brother Hassan, La Hawla Wala Quwata Illa Billah Al Ali Al Adi Inna Lillah Wa Inna Ilayhi Rajiun Wa Sayyamu Al Ladin Zalamu Ayyam Un Qalabin Yan Qalibun Wa Al Aqibatu Lil Muttaqeen اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج والعافية والناس برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على